Hello, hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back. Uh, in this video, it was going to be a, just a quick uh, going over how I do uh, weapons effects within uh, Lightwave and how that, you know, could theoretically translate to any other application uh, you're going to use and how it should, you know, generally work within your uh, compositing environment. Uh, it's, I'm not going to go, you know, load up After Effects and do all that kind of stuff to uh, to kind of show it off, but I'm just going to quickly talk about um, using this uh, very quickly thrown together scene as an example. Um, but uh, someone was asking me earlier, uh, you know, what's the best way of doing weapons effects within Lightwave today? Uh, he seemed uh, not happy with uh, what he was getting with Lightwave's new volumetric system. And my question to him kind of is, why are you using volumetrics when I mean, you should be using geometry? Uh, geometry is easily the most flexible uh, and transportable means between applications and render engines and all that kind of stuff. So, um, yeah, as you can see here, I'm rendering in Octane. Uh, I've almost never rendered in Lightwave's uh, native uh, renderer anymore, uh, unless there's a very specific reason, um, usually pipeline related. Uh, but. Uh, Uh, first and foremost, um, you know, how did I set this up? So the first thing I did is I went ahead and uh, just created a sphere. I did it right in layout, uh, then I saved it out. Uh, created a sphere, um, stretched it out, scaled it down, um, set up a uh, particle emitter. Um, Just set up how you would normally with some sort of like, you know, a tracer fire type of situation. Um, so, you know, no particle resistance or, you know, uh, whatever, you know, whatever settings you need. Um, you know, you can make this go, you know, faster if you want. And of course, it's Octane, so you're going to have to update it. Um, But uh, then I just uh, attached that to uh, an instancer. So I went ahead and grabbed um, instance generator, signed a blaster bolt, set it to particles, um, set its alignment to the particles, and made sure that the particle alignment was set to um, their motion. And so, uh, as you can see, the blaster fire uh, is you know stretching down. That's probably the hardest thing to do in this whole setup because it's all really easy. Uh, just knowing that you have to set that up in the uh, in the uh, emitter itself um, under rotation aligned to path. Um, otherwise, you know your um, you know your blaster bolts are going to be like going sideways or something like that, according to you know from their length or whatever. And so um, you can change you know what they look like just by taking the original and ch you know stretching its direction or you know adjusting its uh, uh, stretch direction or whatever um, in uh, in here or you can do it in the instancer it's all no big deal um, if you were to render this scene out uh, for compositing what I would actually recommend is uh, setting your uh, uh, your various weapon effects uh, to like a kind of a packed RGB type of thing so you know instead of uh, having this be the correct color uh, for the weapon effect, I would make it like two, two, or 255 green, have this stuff 255 red, which it already is, uh, and then you know render that out in its own pass with no other emissives in the scene. And so then you can then uh, isolate this channel, recolor to the correct color, isolate this channel, recolor to the correct color, do any kind of post effects and glows and you know whatever that you want to do um, to it there. Uh, because 99% of the time these days you render this stuff with radiosity turned on, it automatically gives you the emissive lighting interactions and stuff that you would normally want uh, unless you're really confined for time. And then, of course, you could turn that stuff off, although we're in Octane, so, you know, I'm not saying you get that entirely for free, but you might as well be getting it for free. Um, and so I wouldn't have, um, you know, the emissives on the ship back here. 
um, turned on for this particular pass, but you you know you get the idea. Uh, if you wanted to have like a more traditional phaser look instead of just a solid color, well again you just open up this disc in Modeler and you know perhaps uh, you know give it some concentric circles so you'd have like a strong inner core. Uh, then you'd have you know um, you know kind of a, a dimmer kind of textured outside and you know maybe they'd both be using transparency maps to kind of break up their shapes and all that kind of stuff. Um, and uh, that's pretty easy and straightforward how to do. I'm not going to cover, you know, going through the details here, but uh, that's how I would do it. And that's how I've done it in the past. Uh, I've done a lot of this kind of stuff. I've been doing, been using Lightwave since like 96. I've been doing 3D in general, you know, since at least 94. So you know, I've been doing this a very long time. And generally this method has carried through my entire uh, career doing this type of stuff. Um, I know for a long time, in early days of Lightwave, you know, for production, they would use a post-process thing, but, you know, the post-process, you know, uh, stuff for doing weapons effects, and I forget the name of it, it's been that long, um, but, uh, and I remember, you know, in the early 2000s, someone going, why wouldn't you just use this post-process thing? It's basically the same reason why I wouldn't want to use volumetrics, is because you can see this in the viewport, uh, and it's not, you know... You know, we're not just squinting to find a particle or, you know, whatever like we used to do, you know, uh, for a little while I was using surface voxels for doing the blaster stuff because it was easier, it was before we had instancing, so it was a little bit easier to set up rather than, you know, attaching each um, bolt uh, using FX linker to a particle system. Now we just use instancing, it's a lot easy, uh, a lot easier, um, but, you know, that was like really the only time where I thought volumetrics, you know, was okay, uh, basically because it solved an ease of use problem, and at the time, we weren't really doing a whole lot of mixed pipeline stuff anyway. But now almost everything is mixed pipeline, and so you kind of have to go with what transports between various applications. Um, and so uh, once instancing came out, I went back to using geometry. Um, uh, the other thing is, is uh, because we're using geometry, we can, you know, track exactly where we're hitting stuff. Um, in the case of the particle stuff, you just spawn more particles uh, on the impact point. Um, uh, I wouldn't necessarily use volumetrics there either um, for something like this because you just want little flashes of stuff. So you could do displaced geometry. And that would be fine. Uh, for the blaster or for the phaser fire here, obviously, you know, now you're starting to get into like fluid sim ter territory because it would be a beam and be going, you know, coming up and billowing, you know, out for whatever. And so, in that case, yeah, you'd be using, you know, volumetrics, quote unquote, but, you know, with, uh, you, know, op you know, open source uh, volumetric solutions, you'd then be able to transport that between applications. So, I would never use Lightweave's built in uh, volumetrics tool for that. Uh, or going back to their old hypervoxel systems, which you never know will still be in the next version, you know, because it's a uh, deprecated feature, and you can you can enable it, but I doubt they're doing much to maintain it under the hood. So it's only going to get worse over time. And currently, you know, there's no straightforward way of getting it to do motion blur anymore because it's not, you know, and it hasn't been updated for the uh, updated render engine. So. Um, which they may fix in the patch, they may not. Uh, but uh, last I heard, it doesn't work um, with motion blur anyway. So there's really no point in uh, in doing that. Um, so yeah, that's uh, pretty much it. Uh, I know it's been a little bit rambly, but I didn't sit down and write a script or anything like that for this. So um, uh, thanks everyone for uh, watching. I hope that explains my point of view on this. Uh, you know, like I said, this is probably the easiest straightforward most straightforward way of setting this stuff up um, and it works best with a uh, compositing pipeline I know hypervox was traditionally had really poor alpha channel support so you'd bring it you know the alpha into your you know compositing application and the color would change because the alpha channel look was different and so I always used to have to do these little tricks to kind of bring this color and stuff back when I was compositing that stuff so um, yeah so you don't run into any of that kind of problem here. Um, and it can look as good as you want it. Uh, yeah.
you could even run displacements on such events. It's just geometry, so you want to break you know break it up more than just maybe transparency maps. Um, you could do that, um, and of course you can make it grayscale. And if you're doing it by itself, I also recommend just doing it in grayscale um, rather than coloring it. But you can you know make it grayscale in post and do some adjustments that way too. That's fine, but uh, it won't come in white. Uh, if you do it, that will come in gray because it's a solid color here. Uh, but yeah, anyway, thank you all for watching, and I'll talk to you next time.